Hi, we are going to be talking about violence and sexual violence in this series. If that is upsetting for you, please take care while you're listening. Back in February 2013, I was sitting inside Earwolf Studios, a comedy podcast production company here in Hollywood. Back then, comedy podcasts were the thing. But on that particular day, writer Michelle McNamara and I were sitting side by side. We were pretty nervous and dead serious. We had just published her groundbreaking story called In the Footsteps of a Killer in Los Angeles Magazine. The article was about a serial rapist and murderer who terrorized California from 1974 to 1986. He was known then as the East Area Rapist and the original Night Stalker, or by the combined acronym, EURONS. But thanks to Michelle, you probably know him better as the Golden State Killer. I've edited a lot of interesting stories in my career, but this was my first plunge into true crime. And it was with a serial predator who, at the time, was still at large. Michelle had uncovered so much material that we couldn't possibly fit it all into the magazine. So we decided to do this one-off, single-episode podcast. And to help us out, Michelle's husband, the comedian Patton Oswalt, arranged for us to get an hour of studio time, and we definitely made the most of it. So here we are in 2013. Why don't we just start, Michelle, with the feature and the scope of a profile of a serial killer that I had never heard of until we had talked about this story. Right, yeah. And, you know, frankly, I'm not sure that at his height, at his heyday, people knew much about him either. That's part of the reason he flew under the radar. In the podcast, we talked about her reporting. We got into her process and the relationship she cultivated and what was at the heart of her burning obsession with writing about crime. To me, it really is just the puzzle. It's like the amassing of ominous details and then trying to arrange them into something that makes sense. And the, in the possibility, you know, that, that a lot of these do get cold very fast. People don't, aren't able to give them the attention they need. And the possibility that some of them could be solved is, is fascinating to me. Michelle was also driven by the desire to get answers for the survivors and the victims' families and she was dedicated to making it happen. There's so many ways to find people now that, yeah, you just sort of feel like he's got nowhere else to hide. Almost immediately after our Los Angeles Magazine article was published, Michelle gets a book deal, and she starts writing what would become I'll Be Gone in the Dark, One Woman's Obsessive Search for the Golden State Killer. Michelle died in 2016, and unfortunately, she never witnessed the release of her own book, which came out in February 2018. She also wasn't here for the capture of the Golden State Killer two months later. Her book is now the basis of a brand new six-part documentary series called All Be Gone in the Dark. The show not only chronicles Michelle's investigation into the identity of the Golden State Killer and his eventual arrest, it also takes a deeper look into the stories of the survivors and the writer behind it all, Michelle McNamara. And this is the official Companion Podcast. I'm Nancy Miller, and it feels like I get to come full circle hosting this show. And I'm happy to say there's more than one episode this time. Right after the documentary series airs each week on HBO, I'll be joined by special guests. I'll speak with the people closest to Michelle and to the case itself, like her husband, Patton Oswalt, Detective Carol Daly, My Favorite Murders, Karen Kilgariff, Survivors, and more to give an even deeper understanding of Michelle's hunt for the Golden State Killer. But first, I wanted to start with the filmmakers behind the series. Academy Award nominee and Emmy Award winning director Liz Garbus and director and producer Elizabeth Wolfe. Welcome, Liz Garbus. Hi, thanks for having me. And Elizabeth Wolfe, great to have you. Hi, thank you. Liz Garbus, you are obviously an acclaimed director, producer, documentarian. What drew you to this project? 
So the project came about because HBO brought me the galleys of this incredible book by this incredible woman, Michelle McNamara. And as soon as I started pouring through it, I just felt so in love with this voice. The writing was exquisite. The insights were profound. I felt I knew her. I felt I related to her. And I was immediately interested, not only because I was interested in this unsolved case, but because I was really interested by this woman. So I said, yes, I would love to be involved with this. And it was a huge undertaking. And so I assembled the most amazing team of fellow filmmakers and producers, of which Elizabeth Wolf was the first. And she is a producer and also director of two of the episodes of the series. Elizabeth? Can you talk a little bit more about your part in this project? Before this project came along, I knew that I wanted to work with Liz. And I was so grateful when Liz reached out. She said, you know, how do you feel about true crime? And and I said, uh... I like true crime, um, but, you know, it's stark material. And, you know, she said, well, take a look at this book. And I read it and I was really taken by the psychological mystery of Michelle's story and the story within a story and within a story. And immediately in the book, you could see the different puzzle pieces that we as documentarians could use to put this on a screen. And from the get-go, you know, Liz and I worked very closely in figuring out what the story was going to be. How are we going to translate a book into a documentary? What new material did we have to get? How were we going to explore what isn't included in Michelle's book, Michelle's death? And then, of course, you know, very early on, the Golden State Killer was caught. And so then we had to approach how we were going to tell that story. So, It's almost like science fiction, and there are these multiple universes, Michelle McNamara and who she is. And then there's like the 1970s and 80s Golden State Killer timeline. And then there's the world of citizen detectives and trying to crack the case over this past decade. And then finally, there's the present and everything that's going on right now. So can you talk a little bit about episode one and why you decided to start with Michelle's universe first? In the same way that I think you fell in love with Michelle's voice, we did too. And that voice grounds every episode. Even though she's no longer with us, what was extraordinary was how much of her from Patton, from her family members that we could raise to make her feel alive and present in the documentary. So, yes, in episode one, we meet Michelle, a crime writer with an obsession. She started a blog called True Crime Diary. And I think, you know, now everyone says, oh, true crime this, true crime that, it's everywhere. This was before that. You know, this was before Serial. This was before Making a Murderer. This was before a lot of the classics in the genre that we now all know. So Michelle was really ahead of her time in that. And she loved the mystery. She loved the idea that she could help move these stories forward and bring some justice to the victims. This case, then known by the strange moniker Ear Ons, a man responsible for 50 rapes and 12 murders. How did the whole world not know about this? (laughs) How was this not on the tip of our tongues, like Zodiac or Son of Sam? Like, how was this case under the radar? Who were these people who had lost so much to this man with a very clumsy moniker? Now, this is a really important part of understanding the series that I think is really profound and distinct. And I think it echoes what Michelle McNamara did and how she bent the genre, which is she did not focus from the perspective of the killer in the killings. She focused on the perspectives of the survivors. Elizabeth Wolf, did you take that same approach? Yeah, I, we very early on knew that we wanted the Michelle story to be from as much as possible Michelle's point of view and for the story of these horrible, heinous crimes and this case to be from the perspective of the survivors. And so often in true crime, and especially in true crime documentary, you find that survivors are brought in to be interviewed just about this moment of trauma in their lives. And it was very important for us, especially as we got to know the survivors and listen to them about what was important for them in getting their story out there, was that their 
lives went on and that there was so much more both to dealing with that trauma, but also to their lives. And um, that was really an important decision in terms of weaving their stories in throughout the series. You know, what's interesting for me is I started my career as a very young filmmaker making films inside prisons. And one of the things an inmate journalist who I worked with on my first film in Angola prison in Louisiana said is, you know, in telling our stories, remember a human being is not equal to their worst action. And I think actually that particular mantra has informed all of my filmmaking. And in the same way, looking at the survivors of these crimes, those hours that they went through this, bound, tortured, psychologically and physically violated, there's a whole life after that. There's that trauma. You know, one of our survivors refers to rape as a soul murder. You know, you never fully recover. It's always with you. But they are so much more, and there's so much more to learn from their journeys about survival, about how to cope in this world with a lot of pain. Even if you're lucky enough to have never gone through anything like they did, you know, we learn things about Michelle, things that she went through over the course of this film that it was hard for her to talk about and that were suppressed. And those wounds fester and not talking about them and not exploring all those ripple effects drives folks to distraction or self-medication or whatever else. And I think that in looking at these folks, looking at their struggles to move on with their lives, to make something of it, to bond with the other women, to get beyond the silences enforced by their families was of great interest to us. It's interesting because if you look at 1998's The Farm, which is the documentary I think you're referring to, that is a story about the lapse in criminal justice, and maybe this is the shared territory, the other side, which is the survivor side. But it seems like this is one of among many projects that you've done that have highlighted injustice in the way that people are lost or neglected in the criminal justice system. And this applies to, in this instance, how survivors were treated after their attack. What were some of the things that either surprised you or didn't surprise you about how these survivors, and they would have been called victims up until very recently, were treated. So much. I mean, you know, of course, intellectually, you know, we know women couldn't hold their own credit cards in 1970s, so perhaps it shouldn't be so surprising the way in which they were treated as survivors, victims of rapes. It was really incredible that it was considered a misdemeanor in many of the jurisdictions, that rape was not considered a violent crime um, or not considered a felony. After the rape, there was none of the protocols that are in place or should be in place today about female counseling, how you handle dealing with a woman's body, which has become a piece of evidence. You know, one of our survivors talks really graphically and painfully about that experience and the ways in which rapes were just not considered serious crimes. The serial rapists that were running around in the 70s are, are just, you know, it's shocking how many rapes they were getting away with one after the other, after the other, after the other. While I should be a little more hardened to this and expected, it was really surprising and disheartening hearing their stories. In addition to all the interviews you conducted with survivors, you also got a ton of stuff from Michelle's archives from Patton. I remember really clearly when Michelle passed away, I emailed Patton and was like, this is the editor's version of a casserole. It's everything I have from that story. There's the emails, the files, whatever it is, I handed it over. So you probably had a lot of material to sort through. How did you get that material? And how did you go through it, Elizabeth? Patton was extraordinarily generous. He had her laptops, he had her phone, he had all this material, but he really couldn't look at it. So we had every digital file and email going back to 2004. Michelle was 34 at the time. And so we had from 2004 until her passing in 2016, that's 12 years of a woman's life. And we spent months diving into this material, organizing it, logging it, creating timelines. We kind of went in without an agenda. We just wanted to understand her through 
the incredible material she left behind. And we had so much. We had notes to self. We had everything that you can imagine digital. And there was such an emotional lure to that. I mean, everything was so alive on the page. But it was also haunting. There was an aspect of it of, you know, should I be looking at these digital relics in the first place? Who should be? It both felt intrusive and as exhilarating as I'm sure Michelle felt when she was hot on a suspect. I was thinking the same thing, that there's a meta aspect to this, right? Yeah. But what I'm really curious about, and maybe Liz, you speak to this, what was it like being able to get both a 30,000-foot view and a three-inch view into 12 years of someone's life? I've made films about people before. You know, I made a film about Nina Simone, for instance, or Bobby Fischer. You know, I have researchers spending six months to track down one photo of that era when Bobby Fischer was sleeping on someone's couch in Vienna, right? And you have to scour the globe and you get these little pieces and you can piece together a story. Here, you have, like you said, almost a moment by moment life story digitally encapsulated on this hard drive. And that's what we're all leaving behind. You know, we really have left moment by moment documents of our existence, which is why I think, you know, for Patton, it was so tremendously difficult to open that up. And also for us was a huge responsibility to take on. I don't know, if you looked at my text from the past week, there's probably 50 things I said that I'm ashamed of, right? You know, or snarky comments or, you know, whatever those things are. And, you know, I would hate for someone to have, who I don't know, to have those in their possession and be making decisions on how to tell my story. So yeah, there's a lot that like felt like it was not ready for prime time. So you made those decisions based upon on what was important to the story, what was, I think, important socially and culturally. And yeah, just as a human being and thinking about Alice, too, you know, that there's a daughter there. Yes. So all those things go into those decisions. We hear recordings of Michelle throughout the series, but we also hear actor Amy Ryan as the voice of Michelle. How did you connect with her? Amy Ryan is a national treasure. She is just an incredible actor from comedy in The Office to an Oscar nomination for Gone Baby Gone and drama. And I had the opportunity to direct her in my scripted film called Lost Girls, where she played the lead. And I just have tremendous respect. So she's the first person I thought of. I knew she could rock a Midwestern accent. I knew she would care deeply about Michelle and relate to her. She has that empathy. So we were lucky when she decided to get on board and she was just such a great team player with us. You probably know this, but Lost Girls is one of Michelle McNamara's favorite true crime books. I know. I mean, it's so crazy. That's another point of connection where, you know, I've read all of her Gilgo Beach posts. I mean, of course, Bob Kolker, who wrote Lost Girl, who's also just an extraordinary nonfiction. You know, you don't even want to say true crime because people now associate that with something cheap. But they're extraordinary writers in the vein of a Truman Capote bringing such empathy and exquisiteness to their language choices. That's a really critical aspect of true crime and the moniker and what it means. How do you create a series that has a lot of the elements of what would be considered true crime, which is entertainment, ensuring that something is accurate and high quality. What are those hallmarks as you're putting that together? Well, I'm a little tired of this whole thing, I have to say. <laughs> because, because I mean, for me, I've been making films in the criminal justice system since before I even heard the two words true crime put together. Mm-hmm. And so I'm interested in crime and punishment. Um, you know, so was Dostoevsky. There's a long tradition of telling stories that deal with the edges of human behavior. And to kind of lump everything together as true crime degrades it because it is a worthy area of exploration and and has created some great art. I mean, Michelle McNamara's book is one of them, as is In Cold Blood. And I don't have a problem with saying that this series has aspects of true crime. I guess I just have problems with um, everything that has to do with crime that's nonfiction storytelling being lumped into something that deprives it of its uniqueness and humanity. I guess when I think about true crime, I think of something that is in some ways sensational, like Elizabeth was saying earlier, reduces the survivors or victims to this one salacious moment of their lives. I don't actually see a lot of stuff that does that. You know, I actually see a lot of great documentary films and doc series on 
crime and punishment in America. We have a lot of problems here, many of them deeply ingrained due to racial biases, gender biases. I think these are worthy avenues of exploration. So I think one of the reasons why Michelle was able to earn the trust of law enforcement and survivors and attract a really big audience was because she didn't fall back on those familiar true crime cliches. And I got to say, this series doesn't follow them either. Like, I noticed you found a way to portray some pretty graphic material, and it doesn't feel like exploitation. Were there specific things that you did or didn't do to ensure that? We watched a lot of crime shows. We looked at them with a critical eye going into this, and we knew very early on that, like, we were not going to be telling this with, like, the flashlight from the point of view of Eurons, and we weren't going to have an actor in bed. And we thought a lot about what was the experience of the survivor and what were they hearing? What were the sounds of suburbia? You know, so often when you see a story about a rape or a murder, it's like this really dramatic score And in our research, we found that the pacing and the scoring is through the point of view of the aggressors getting off. And we just like immediately were like, we are not doing it that way. And once we knew we weren't going to do it that way, it was a matter of what now? And so, you know, we thought a lot about music and sound design. And we thought also about how do you depict a world turning upside down? And you'll see we have this camera angle where the camera turns almost all the way around. And in many ways, that was a device to really depict somebody's life being completely disrupted. And then we let them tell their story. And it was very important that we stayed with the women on camera during uncomfortable moments and let them tell it through the memories that they had. So often, as Elizabeth said, there's that woman in the bed, you know, lying in wait like a piece of prey or meat for a vulture. Yes, it makes you nervous. It makes you scared. It makes you want to go under the covers, but it's giving the power to the perpetrator. So at the end of the day, it's about point of view. And it's something that I think, especially when you have women directors, it comes quite naturally to flip the switch on that. I mean, you could tell the story in 20 ways, right? But me personally, as a filmmaker, and I think Elizabeth as a co-filmmaker in this process with me, could tell it in one way, which was a female point of view, innately because we are female. It is something that colors everything, where you point the camera. It covers how you ask the questions. It covers which photos you include and which you don't. It covers how you talk about what happens after the crime, how you understand what happened before. I mean, I think it's just having that 360-degree view of a person's humanity that makes it inherently not salacious. It cannot be salacious if you are identifying deeply with someone's pain. So I think that all comes down to those three letters of POV and every decision that's made in edit and everything that's left out. And one thing I'll share that I shared with the Gone in the Dark team, because I think, you know, in, in filmmaking, you confront these decisions a lot. There's a film I made for HBO called There's Something Wrong with Aunt Diane. It's a story of a upper middle class mom. Seems like she had it all together one weekend driving back from the campground on a sunny Sunday afternoon with her three nieces in the car, her baby daughter and her son, entered the Taconic Parkway, driving 80 miles an hour down the wrong side of the highway and crashed into another car with three men killing all of them and killing all of her nieces, her baby daughter, herself the only survivor, her young son. You can imagine the photos that came out of that crime scene, the questions of what you show and you don't show. There was one photo that we did show, which was the mom deceased at the site. And I lived with that and have grown to feel very uncomfortable about it. And I talked a lot about that with our Gone in the Dark team about how I felt about that and was it necessary? Did it add to the story? If I had to go back, would I do it differently? And I think I would. It, it just informed a lot of my thinking on this and how you tell a story respectfully, how to handle these stories that involve so much pain for so many people, the survivors, the victims, and all of their families. 
No doubt, it's a huge responsibility, and I think you handle it really well in this series. Something that I think makes for a great magazine article and a great documentary is the depth of the work. And that's something Michelle did incredibly well. She wasn't just a genius stylist. She was also a phenomenal reporter. And this meant forging relationships with cops, forging relationships with survivors, and it turns out forging relationships with an inmate. Elizabeth, can you tell me more about that? So after the L.A. Magazine article came out and she was exploring more research and really turning her attention deeper and deeper into trying to catch this guy, she um, learned about a guy named Troy Graves, who's a serial rapist and murderer who attacked women in Philadelphia and Colorado in like the mid to late 90s, early aughts, and is currently serving a life sentence in Colorado. We actually discovered this through her laptop and then spoke with Paul Haynes and some of her other citizen detective friends who said, oh yeah, Troy Graves. She she had a pen pal relationship with Troy Graves. You know, she thought that if she could write to somebody who had a similar case to the GSK, that she could get inside the mind of a serial rapist murderer who invaded homes and get information that would somehow lead her to the Golden State Killer. And so it was really incredible because we found her typed letters to Troy Graves and then his responses— So we have six to eight letters from each of them over the course of 2014, 2015. And it's incredible to see her patience as a journalist because she was slow playing this guy and she wrote him in a very charming way saying that she had read somewhere that he was a bookworm and that she herself loves books. And she wrote to him about her favorite stories He sent her a poem. Then she responded, sending poems that she wrote in college. And, you know, she didn't come right out and say, hey, this is my agenda. I'm looking to understand you better in the hopes of finding this guy. She was slow playing it. But unfortunately, she never got to the point of saying, you know, asking him about his crimes, asking him about his childhood. And so when we found this, I thought, well, we've got a right to Troy Graves. And I thought, well, let's see if we can interview him. (laughs) Wait, I'm sorry. Who over lattes or whatever was like, well, we got to write Troy Graves? I mean, every time we learned about somebody, we're like, we got to reach out to them. I mean, we reached out to so many people. (laughs) Um, and, And I think that was a part of how inspiring Michelle was for all of us on this project because her research inspired our own research. And so if she was going to write to Troy Graves, well, of course, we were going to as well. So, Elizabeth, how's your poetry? (laughs) (laughs) What we did instead of sending poetry is that we sent a copy of Michelle's book to him. And he wrote back saying that, you know, he had held Michelle in high regard and how sad he was when her letters abruptly stopped. And it wasn't until her book had come out in 2018 and was getting press that he was watching TV one day and learned about her death. And, you know, ultimately, he said he did not want to do an interview with us, even though we know that she wanted to ask some hard questions. She really took the time to meet him on common ground and talk about shared interests. And it was really just an incredible window into her dedication to learning about all aspects of this story. A profile writer I once met described when she was researching someone and writing a profile about them, she feels like she lives in their skin, which is a strange context when we're talking about a serial killer series. Do you feel that you have inhabited Michelle McNamara? And how much time have you spent thinking about Michelle and thinking about what she would do and thinking about how you could have been friends and thinking about those things? And and I don't know if it's for me, it's still difficult. And is it for you? You know, you, you knew her and you worked with her directly and we've always been removed by the whatever separates us and wherever she, Michelle is. But Yeah. I mean, we've been on this project for two plus years and I 
think about her. I feel like I know her and we wish she were here. I bet we would have all made a documentary together. That would have been really great. (laughs) Um, And we hope we've uh, done it well in her absence. You know, during this project, I read in a really, really incredible book by the biographer Jim Atlas. It was a memoir about his life as a literary biographer called The Shadow in the Garden. And he writes about the emotional bond the biographer develops with her subject, but also the biographer's betrayal of her subject in the sense that you have to tell the truth in a way that the subject, if she were writing for herself, might write in a different way. And, you know, I have spent two years reading books on Michelle's bookshelf, scrolling through her iCloud. Our whole team has made a point to, like, acknowledge her birthday and the day of her death every year. And we we found ourselves in the production, you know, in our offices, seeing something and thinking, oh, my God, Michelle would love that. You really come to develop this emotional bond with your subject. And Patton talks about how the book coming out was sort of this another way of saying goodbye to Michelle. And, you know, it's so hard for me to say that this coming out is, you know, sort of saying goodbye to Michelle because I never got a chance to know her. It was something that we ha- I had to sort of adjust myself when I would speak with her siblings or her friends. And I would have to remind myself, like, wait, they know Michelle. Like, I don't know Michelle. And it was Adam, who we interviewed, who said, we all know one aspect of Michelle. But then he also said, but you must know these things that we don't know about Michelle because you've had this window. Somewhere in that is this full person. And, you know, I hope that from all these points of views in the series, something as close to whole comes through. By the end of the series, we get what feels like the most complete portrait possible of Michelle through the people she grew up with and the people she worked with and those who loved her. And we'll be hearing from a lot of them on this podcast in the coming weeks. But I'm also pleased to have you both featured in each episode with more behind the scenes details. And I look forward to speaking more as we go through the series. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nancy. All right, to be continued. Thanks to director Liz Garbus and director and producer Elizabeth Wolf for joining us. And, of course, thank you, everyone, for listening. Next week, we will take a deep dive into the world of true crime with the queen of the genre, my favorite murders, Karen Kilgariff. And on June 29th, there's a hearing for the Golden State Killer case where suspect Joseph D'Angelo is expected to plead guilty. So we'll be giving new updates on the case. You can listen to that episode right after the second installment of All Be Gone in the Dark, which premieres next Sunday, July 5th at 10 p.m. Eastern on HBO. I'm Nancy Miller. This podcast was produced by HBO in conjunction with Pineapple Street Studios. Our team at Pineapple Street Studios includes executive producers Jenna Weiss-Berman, Max Linsky, and Barry Finkel. Our managing producer is Gabrielle Lewis. This episode's lead producer is Emmanuel Hapsis. Our associate producer is Tanel Anderson. Our researcher is Melissa Slaughter. And our editors are Maddie Sprung-Kaiser and Joel Lovell. Our engineer is Noriko Okabe. Original music is by Andrew Epen of Basement Crafts. Special thanks to Liz Garbus, Elizabeth Wolf, and Kate Berry, and everyone else at Story Syndicate. This podcast couldn't exist without you. If you like the show and you have a minute, you can review and rate this podcast via Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else you might get your podcasts. It really helps people find the show. Until next week. If you or someone you know has been sexually assaulted, you can get help by calling the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, or RAIN. You can call their 24-hour hotline at 800-656-HOPE or visit hbo.com gone for more resources.